we had our relatives over and we she had to go with her father i had to go this way so the magic was still we were dancing between just being engaged and so finally i was like we made a promise like when we get engaged we're not going to do anything until marriage and and I dove in and I dove in, in the Bible. Where in the Bible does it say a priest has to ordain it or there has to be another man that tells me, do you do you take her? Or do you take this? And I'm trying to dig and dig and dig. And then and then I thought as humans, when we corrupt God's word, we always place a man in between us and God. That this man has to finish up God's work. I pushed the person that I love the most in the wrong direction. And I know one day I'll be I'll be answering to that. First, I have to commend George for his humility and sincerity. I'm sure this was very difficult to admit in front of so many viewers. And I think we can clearly see George's genuineness in display here. These are signs of someone who is truly seeking God regardless of where he has been. And that is exactly the Christian message, the good news. Truly, I can only commend him for that. But in all love and humility, I believe that discussion took on a wrong turn. Let's listen. But the one thing that I can't get off my chest yeah. and it is stuck there. It's uh, when I asked her to marry me and I made a promise to God first and then I made a promise to her father on earth um, that when she is mine, I will honor her like my church. Mm -hmm. And there was this this thing in my chest, man, like it immediately when I had his blessing, it left me. And I felt like this, like God forbid I had cancer in me and, and it was, it just died and it left and I couldn't unshake it. And so we had our relatives over and we, she had to go with her father. I had to go this way. So the magic was still, we were dancing between just being engaged. And so finally I was like, we made a promise. Like when we get engaged, we're not going to do anything until marriage. And, and then we, we you know, we were distant, we we're distant. And then finally, when we saw each other and we were in the moment, obviously we we're going to, you know, fail. And I felt like when God looked down at me before, he wasn't pleased with me. But at that moment he was pleased with me. Okay. What had changed? So I searched for it because okay. I was like, I feel it. It's a spirit. I feel it. And I dove in and I dove in, in the Bible. Where in the Bible does it say a priest has to ordain it or there has to be another man that tells me, do you, do you take her? Or do you take this? And I'm trying to dig and dig and dig. And then I call my, my friend Cliff, him and his son, Stuart. They go around and they, they talk about the gospel. And he's a great man that I could call. And he always answers. And, and I'm crying on the phone. I go, Cliff, I can't find where the marriage ceremony is that God blesses a man. All I could find is that when the father gives permission and then I thought, as humans, when we corrupt God's word, we always place a man in between us and God, that this man has to finish up God's work. And then I thought, well, it just makes so much sense that if I would have taken a woman for her house, all I really truly need in God's eyes is the permission of her father. So now mm -hmm. I'm looking through the scripture and I can't find anywhere besides showing the world that I've made a promise to her. And that is now mm -hmm. my covenant with her. So what I'm going to is now when I look at her, I don't, I don't feel like I have to wait for a man to tell me that you're now married. I made that promise to God. And when I look at her, this woman, I almost feel guilty telling people that that's my fiance when and truly I feel that's my wife already. But the word of God tells us to be careful and not to always rely on feelings. Feelings can be deceitful and we are often enticed by our own desires. The lack of guilt is not necessarily a sign of God's approval here. But I have to admit that I'm deeply concerned with George's second point. He says, as humans, when we corrupt God's word, we put a man between us and God. But where did he get this from? Ironically, I can guarantee that it came from another man because it is definitely not written in scripture. But who is it that chose the 12 disciples to lead the church? Who is it that gave these same disciples authority to baptize in his name in Matthew 28? Who is it that gave the authority to forgive or retain sins to the disciples in John 20? Who is it that chose St. Paul who clearly had authority over the church even to excommunicate someone or restore him back? Isn't it God himself? It is God who seeks humanity to work with him for the salvation of others. The problem is that we often forget that these human beings that God ordained as disciples and apostles are the ones that the Holy Spirit worked with to write scripture itself. And we forget that the church was alive and well before the New Testament scripture was even written. And we also forget that Christ told these same apostles that the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth to be able to properly lead the church. 
This doesn't mean that they are perfect or won't make mistakes, but that the Holy Spirit is guiding the Church Christ's body despite of human weakness. Since this foundational element in the logic is incorrect, the entire argument falls. Now this next section of the interview is very interesting because Jordan Peterson starts to lead George on the right path that will fulfill all his desires. And I hope that I can add a bit to what Jordan said that will ultimately point towards why the church does what she does. So throughout the interview, George seemed to go back and forth between pleasing God or pleasing his parents. He knew that he needed to please both since God asks us to honor our parents. So I'm trying to see what is your thoughts in the Bible? Well, does why it not say? bring it all together? Never thought of it that way. You know, I mean, you know, if I Fair I guess enough, I'm so worried and I'm like tunnel vision because every time I widen my perspective and I lean on what they would like, it always oh, ends I up. Oh, I see the problem. Imagine you're looking for the optimized solution. Yeah. Okay, then bring everything together. Yeah. Bring them together. Make the consensus work in, in the same direction. Bring your community around you and you're hospitable to them so they're welcome. You, you, you lay out your vows in good faith you feed them, they dance, they get a chance to see each other. It's a celebration. The union and of both your communities, right? Yeah, so the yeah. union of my community and his community so that we could all be one. To eva yeah. That's right. To, to evaluate each other to some degree. And the conclusion of the whole matter is that marriage is a blessing given by God when two people choose to enter into a covenant with each other and to love each other unconditionally. This mystery is done in front of God and other witnesses with the approval of the parents. But where would you think is the most appropriate place to receive God's blessing in front of witnesses, so in public, and with the approval of the parents? Wouldn't it be in front of the altar of God in the church during a liturgical setting or a public act? So it was very natural for the church to start celebrating this covenantal ceremony in the house of God as the church was and still is being led into all truth by the Holy Spirit. However, before this was done within a church building, marriages were blessed by the bishop. And we can see evidence of this from the early church. St. Ignatius in the very early 2nd century says, When men and women marry, the union should be made with the consent of the bishop so that the marriage be according to the Lord and not merely out of lust. Let all be done to the glory of God. And others say the same.